salmon, November 1st, terms of reference. The protection of fish and fish habitat is integral to Gitsanhuwip government. These tasks are the, dire are the direction in which the Gitsan would like to move. Gitsan government team members open, uh, open discussions with comments over their territories and their fishing sites. Okay. One, the federal and provincial government of Gitsan government's position on the UNAT. UNAT means um, the fishing tenure. The, they will be closing down 2019 fisheries along the Skeena. Common points of discussion, Gitsan culture and traditional history, ownership and jurisdiction as the single tent. Interference, and that means uh, they have no access to uh, the fishing tenures uh, because uh, reserves are in the way with some of them uh, and uh, farms and right of way that CN and highways you can't uh, get through them because uh, because of the uh, signs that are up no trespass <coughs> and um, no trespass and gets and have no fishing permits or licenses uh, and this is a uh, going to be a contentious issue because um, if uh, license are, licenses are issued, uh, then um, people who uh, receive these licenses will be able to go anywhere on, on the territory and fish there. And whereas uh, we have laws um, that says you cannot trespass on another chief's uh, ter uh, territory, or fishing sites, so uh, so that's what, um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, fishing that should be on uh, interference. Okay. That's one of those things. That sometimes they put fences up. No trespass. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what uh, yeah. They, sometimes the farmers, you know, they they get uh, they have crown land. They have crown land, and uh, they have no trespass sign. Thank you, Bobby. Well, we don't recognize crown land in our country. Yeah. Okay. Uh, responses from federal or and provincial representatives. Um, uh, it was jurisdiction uh, and mandate uh, that is our main response. Uh, the state to address um, the treaty, treaty or um, title. So, um, sorry, Chair. Yeah, uh, provincial government are attending meeting as managed. Uh, meeting as management, federal and provincial government representatives would like to work together to do the right thing, just as we are all trying to do it. And uh, that is uh, where um, I was going to, uh, you know, um, when you have dialogue such as this, that's a positive because um, each one, um, each one of the governments uh, accept uh, these negotiations that are going on. And that is a positive move. Um, and that is why I was uh, gonna, we, we naturally have ingrained in us respect for each other. That is how we were taught. So, um, so there is respect uh, from the, uh, the province and the federal government. And um, and that is a, a very good move. Uh, okay, Robin was it uh, excused, excused himself because I uh, had an appointment. Uh, review discussion and regard uh, regarding fishing tenure refer to six A. B and C, fishing tenures and art, March 19. Round table discussion regarding the fishing tenure. tenure. Uh, had a lunch and we convened at 12, uh, 12.35.
Okay, number five is communications. Um, I, I basically discussed that earlier, uh, that we are trying to set up, um, that we are trying to be open with, with all our, um, our uh, members. Uh, established uh, tribunal, that was, uh, that was uh, tabled uh, at, at the last meeting and it's gonna be discussed again today. Uh, number seven, other uh, chiefs would like to meet with the minister responsible for fisheries. Of, um, but you're here, right? And uh, I don't know, I guess they mean the minister, you know, yes. they, they like to have the minister. Uh, but okay, uh, round table discussion. Um, 7A, next meeting, uh, crisis meeting. Uh, with province and, and um, federal government. So that is picked out. So, Sandra's not here, eh? No, not today, just me. Okay, and Colin uh, told us at that time that he's not gonna be here. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Art to the table. Uh, could you introduce yourself, Art? <coughs> Um, we will Shui, um, Art Wilson, uh, and Skaya, Ishpia. Uh, where I reside as a Wolf Refugee Chief. Okay, just, um, we're going to adopt this meeting, uh, minutes. Should we? We will adopt it. No? no. Just okay. notes, not me. Okay. Okay, those are the notes. Okay, uh, number three, province. Um, Minister Donald, uh, McDonaldson's letter, March uh, 27. Safety concerns. And, uh, and um, Patty is going to explain that for 219 season, an update on process legislation for angling licenses and angling guide licenses. Uh, okay, uh, Patty? Sure. Uh, so this uh, follows up to an action item we had, I think it was on our second meeting. And there had been two letters submitted to the province. I think the first was in October 2018. The second one may have been in December of 2018. Um, around these meetings and around the uh, fishing closure notice, and the action was originally for me to see where a response to those letters were at. Just before our last meeting, there was a letter provided from Minister Donaldson uh, in response to those letters. And that letter is attached in our package here today, it is on page four. So I wanted to talk about this first. Um, I don't uh, plan on reading out the letter, but if, if anyone has questions on the letter, um, I'd be happy to uh, have a discussion uh, on that here uh, today, just so that I can um, understand uh, if there's additional information required or if there's um, um, you know other information um, then I can I can uh, take that into consideration and provide uh, more as needed so I'd like to start there are you gonna uh, explain the contents of the letter a little bit well it, it's it's here um, if anyone has yeah so it I could I could walk through what it says if we'd like if that would be helpful sure that? sure okay so it's uh it, the opening paragraph starts by responding to the uh, two letters that were submitted to the province on yes yeah, october 22nd and then december 19th it um, it goes on in the third paragraph to explain that salmon management is under dfo responsibility so the province does not have um, you know, management of salmon fisheries, and it, it clarifies that the um, 
areas where the province does have delegated authority is for the management of fisheries such as uh, trout and uh, char and steelhead. So those are the things that we do manage. And it um, explains a little bit around the conservation measures that are in place around these fisheries. So for steelhead, there's no retention allowed, no one's allowed to kill steelhead uh, for uh, non-First Nations. Um, and for trout, there's uh, conservation closures for um, uh, a big part of the year to allow for, um, uh, you know, uh, spawning uh, primarily, but also for uh, overwintering and rearing success for that species. And uh, for, for char in rivers, so like Dolly Barton and bull trout, there's non-retention. Uh, year-round and that's in response to some of the conservation concerns for that species it's a very um, at least bull trout very aggressive we've seen declines in other jurisdictions so you're not <laughs> allowed to uh, retain them in rivers so it's a pretty conservative environment um, for those species yeah may I ask why the char declines or how do you guys know uh, from some you know we look to other jurisdictions and some of the trends that have occurred. So certainly in Alberta, there's been um, fairly notable declines in bull trout. They, they're very aggressive fish. So when there's anyone fishing for them around, they, they take quite readily to it. And uh, uh, in instances where um, we engage with individuals to talk about fisheries regulations, oftentimes we hear feedback that um, you know, bull trout uh, move around quite a bit and that they aren't where they used to be. And so, um, you know, we take that seriously and, and in a lot of cases we don't, you know, we, we manage uh, the Skeener region and, you know, it's about the landmass of around Germany with four biologists and so it's a bit of a precautionary management as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then the uh, next paragraph goes on to indicate that, you know, right now there's um, there's not information that suggests like a total closure for these species would be required in the context of this kind of conservative uh, regulatory uh, management of those species. But you know certainly that if there's additional information to consider, I think there's there's a lot of room for discussion on that. Um, you know I, I think that the the knowledge in this room and the knowledge within um, the Gitza Nation is significant. And if there's things that um, you know, we need to be taking into consideration for the management of that species. I know that I'm personally all ears. So um, that's that's an important point. Um, and then I think the letter just goes on to say that I'll, it says that I'll be participating to um, engage on these meetings. And, uh, and I think Minister Dalton is also uh, interested in, in, in learning about how this process is going. I think that's the concluding paragraph in the letter. I don't know if there have been meetings with him to talk about this or not, but it sounds like uh, there might be in the future. So uh, does anybody have questions for Patty? Um, like I have one. Uh, okay, you issue licenses for fresh water and uh, the river is uh, fresh water. And, um, I'm just uh, surprised that uh, you didn't mention uh, that uh, you are in control of um, the fish that come up from uh, from the ocean, like uh, you know, spring. Uh, all the fish that come up, uh, because uh, these are the ones that uh, we are very concerned about um, throughout history. You know, even even as. Um, those people uh, came up uh, from supposedly discovering, uh, discovering our country here. Uh, they came in boats, and um, one of the main uh, one of the main things that was traded at those times when they came was uh, sake, and um, they they mentioned uh, that uh, they valued the First Nations valued these. Uh, the uh, sockeye, uh, and they have so much stored uh, dried fish for the winter, not only for winter, uh, but to trade, to trade with other, because at that time they didn't have a monetary uh, system, but uh, their monetary system included uh, all their uh, 
stuff, uh, all the resources they gathered from from um, from the land and from the rivers. So uh, the the people who came here on boats, they were just shocked when they entered when they entered these um, these houses. It was just full full of uh, dried fish, and that is okay. That's okay. And uh, when you have uh, some uh, a concern such as that, a witch, um, that lady uh, that was here, the spirit, the spirit of the land, that is what she meant. It is the spirit of the land, and that is uh, the fish. That is only one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just wondering. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think that is the. Third, the, the intent of the third paragraph is to try to describe who's responsible for what. So their understanding fisheries management is a little bit complicated in the sense that it's split between the province and the federal government. The federal government is responsible for salmon management, the, the things you're describing. Yes. The province is not. Mm -hmm. So the species I described with char and trout and steelhead, those species the province manages with. For the salmon species you're describing, I defer to uh, DFO. Now, that said, it, it's not that straightforward because, um, of course, what about the habitat that these species uh, come into the freshwater environment, they spawn and then they, the young will rear for a period of time and then go into the ocean. So there is, from a habitat perspective, a very, very strong role for the province in, in, in the management on that side. But in as far as, you know, setting um, you know, uh, harvest limits or, or closures or, or, or this for salmon species in freshwater, it is DFO responsibility. Yeah. So that's why I didn't speak to those species. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have questions? Uh, now is the time, uh, Bobby, uh, now is the time to ask them uh, because um, that's what we're here. That's why we're here is to share information and um, he, uh, our people are very knowledgeable as to our laws and how we conserve. So, um, Bobby first, and then uh, Robin. Yeah, you mentioned steelheads with her. Short, short. Am I hearing wrong, or did you say that the natives cannot fish steelhead? No, I, I didn't. Uh, so, I think what I was trying to say is there is um, there is a, a recreational fishery where people are allowed to fish for steelhead during basically the summer and fall yeah. months. They're closed during the winter because they're holding in the river and especially up river overwintering. And what I meant to say is that there's no retention um, for non-First Nations. So, um, you know, non-Indigenous individuals can fish for them, but they can't keep them. Uh, certainly uh, Indigenous um, nations this is a big part, uh, from what I understand, of, of some of the uh, traditional practices, and, and we understand that there is service going on, and that is part of uh, food, social, and ceremonial rights that we recognize. Yes. Yeah. Sure. How do you monitor that? Monitoring uh, First Nations harvest? The non-Indigenous? Yeah. Well, so we, we monitor um, because there's no kill on the fish, like there's no harvest by non-indigenous. They're not allowed to keep those fish. Well, that's why we need the data about how much survived. Yes. Okay. And so, really... okay. And so on that point, um, I, I have, we have some information on that. I, I don't have that today, okay. but there's, there's reports, but um, you know, as I, some of the, but I can say that some of the recent work that we've done on it um, has included uh, investigations on uh, things like catch and release mortality. You know, how long you play a fish, um, you know, the different gear that you use to play that fish, the amount of time you hold it out of the water, um, you know, the, 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 there's a number of variables that can influence um, how that fish survives following release. And so we're trying to educate anglers, saying first and foremost, keep them in the water, um, and you know, be aware that you know, uh, catch and release mortality can be, you know, if it's practiced well, it can be less than ten percent. 
But if it's practiced poorly, it can be 100%. So you can kill the fish. Yeah. So we're trying to communicate to people on that. Um, and, you know, last year there was, a, we have an estimated 44,000 steelhead came back into the system. And even, you know, if you were to apply a five to 10% mortality for catch and release on that, there is, you know, in the order of two to 3,000 steelhead that will probably, um, uh, you know, be, be uh, affected by that fishery. So their age spawning at percentage you're talking about, they're not coming back. Those fish would be killed by the fishery. So even though it's catch and release, there still is the catch and release mortality. Another thing is that sometimes you catch fish with hooks still in the mouth. And that's a big question too. Yeah. Your line breaks and the hooks are still sure. in the mortality right there. There's no way they can survive. Not very long, anyway. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So there's a bit more that I need to provide on that, um, and I will get that. Well, I will get to that to the group. No, um, we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then Amy. Yeah. And sometimes when the fish are <coughs> too tired, they can't revive back. To, yeah. You try to revive them, they'll go belly up. Well, my point is that um, all species of uh, of fish that come up in our river. Every one of them we use uh, in the, for our, our own for our own usages, right? Um, like spring, uh, sockeye, chinook, um, jum, I mean. Um, some of our elders, they, like, they love the different uh, flavors of smoked or jarring. Because I know my mom loves spring salmon. She only wants that as she's getting older. And uh, trout. trout uh, my auntie loves trout. She likes to smoke it, bake it, or whatever. So all, every species used. Um, pink, pink salmon, my dad used to love uh, the first catch. Uh, boiled it up, called Hagel Jam fish soup. So every, I, I believe every single fish that comes up in our river is used for us First Nations. So we don't waste anything. Nothing's being wasted at all. That's my point. And I just wanted to add to um, what Patty was saying, because you know, Stu, of course, DFO manages the salmon fishery, or the salmon resource. And um, so some of the things you probably saw in the news earlier this week, the announcement uh, that the minister had made some decisions on Chinook management, um, really affecting uh, the South Coast uh, and the Fraser, because it's the Fraser stocks that are, are uh, having some challenges. Um, and I, some of those things do have implications for the Skeena River uh, in that they've reduced bag limits and such in the, in the marine for Chinook. Um, and then other measures that I know were being considered for the Skeena, and I've, I've just sent an email to our, our rec manager to see if I can get what the latest was on what was actually approved, um, is you know closing some of the tributaries because of conservation concerns uh, to recreational angling for salmon and Chinook specifically to protect like the spawning habitat, and then also delayed openings for Chinook fishing in the river to to protect those to let so many of those fish get by. Um, so that's. That's just some of the measures that they've been talking about for, from a conservation reason. So that would be the reason that DFO would would shut, would reduce limits or close various uh, salmon fisheries is for conservation reasons. And of course, uh, for conservation, making sure that we have the FSC, the food social ceremonial, that there's adequate fish available for that. And so we've been working quite closely with um, on at a technical level uh, with a lot of the nation's fisheries reps to better understand kind of what that looks like and stuff. To, and we're still in the process of trying to figure out how that feeds into uh, various other processes and communicates back to leadership and things like that. So I know that's the management side of things, but I just wanted to, to mention it. Thank you, Amy. Um, <coughs> Vernon, I should have missed uh, 
you said there was an announcement yesterday. And, uh, there was an announcement two days ago. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I just just wave your hand at me when I'm doing that because I am known for that. Um, yeah, no, the, the minister did make an announcement two days ago uh, about Chinook conservation measures for the Fraser Chinook uh, populations. Yeah. And um, I'll pull up the media release and it has all the exact data information in what, what it. The uh, the Skeena, the Skeena, that's what I'm going to try and find out. Um, there are some measures put in place, um, largely in the marine, because to protect the passing Fraser Chinook, but there are some measures that were being talked about for the Skeena, because the Chinook there as well, you know, need a little bit of help. And so part of the things that were being considered were uh, closing the tributaries to protect the, the spawning Chinook and delaying the opening of uh, recreational Chinook fishing to make sure that they um, have a chance to get by. Uh, on the Fraser, it's it's quite uh, more, uh, I don't know what the word, dire. Uh, they are actually uh, working with the nations down there and they have, um, they are limiting uh, FSC access on the, on for Chinook on the Fraser because the, they're endangered. Some of these species, or some of these uh, populations are nearing extinction. So. But I'll get the, the news release so that okay. you can get out. Yeah. The uh, fish uh, habitat uh, we're talking about. Uh, uh, who's sponsoring the uh, like the spawning grounds? The, the, uh, I know in Guinea they have this uh, gate, mm -hmm. this uh, babine and uh, the fence. They do this year after year after year. I think they did now. They started in the 40s, 50s. And when the gate first uh, in, was in the uh, little Girongach there, there was a gate there. Right after the, the, the chiefs uh, objected to that. Before that, it was just loaded with fish, and just you could almost walk across the river. How much fish every year, after year, after year. But when the gate was put up, and, and, and then the decline started to happen back then. Now, the chiefs uh, put that gate. The current decline is still happening and the project is still going. Now there's not a gate and also a, fish, a fence, I mean, called the fence, and then there's a gate where I believe uh, I've never visited it, but uh, from what I understand, there's a gate by the farming uh, area. Uh, uh, sometimes I hear they, they, they close the gate and the fish. Goes up. They said there's too much escapement, whatever they call it. I see that year after year, for a lot of years, it's doing the same thing over and over again, and yet the fish are declining, especially in Guinea, because uh, there's a lot of logging, and there's a lot of uh, Log jams. Uh, back in the old days, uh, the, the, the chiefs that look after the land uh, <coughs> there, they, they, they love to, to, to respect the land, but they want the land to be to, to, to be left the way the Creator created it. So they help the nature. And that's why you see a lot of us coming up. All of every year after year. And uh, now that the uh, log jumps, they don't want to touch it. So for some reason, they don't want to touch it. And uh, therefore, the, the river diverts maybe six different little creeks. Therefore, the, the, the water is low. The fish can't get up to the spawning area. So, with that, the fish keeps declining. Just how long is this uh, 
fence uh, the gate uh, just how many more years what are they trying to me I don't I can't figure it out for some reason that they do these things year after year after year it's just a job creation and it's not helping the build up for the fish to build up where it was before and uh, I know the old timers back in the 40s and 50s they, they go out and catch steelhead and they're happy going home winter time you don't see that anymore so um, I'm just wondering how long this project is going to keep going and yet uh, our, our rivers are going lower why don't they use that money to, to, to help nature? Is what I'm trying to get at. Okay. There's got to be uh, a change. I don't think what they're doing is helping, to me. No. I don't think what they're doing is helping. Right. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> I respect uh, what you guys are trying to do uh, as uh, monitoring the the anglers the catch and release to us it's against our culture that's against our culture we have uh, a dialogue the Lakskik our, our club has a dialogue that addresses that uh, 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 maybe someday they will tell it but not today unless you ask me uh, so catch and release is against our culture, like uh, Robin said, that they lose, like if you get injured, you could feel that you lose your strength. You can't move when you get injured. That's the way the fish is. That's the way the animal is. If we, in our culture, if we damage fish or wildlife, if we know we're down to it, even though it'll take us a week to, to hunt it down and put it down so it doesn't suffer, that's our culture. Mm -hmm. We don't let fish and wildlife suffer. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, we're not totally against. We, we want to have our input on, on how do we rebuild the stock. That's what we're here for, is to, to have an input. How do we rebuild the stock? And, uh, I know I have some friends in this kind of uh, this government. They, uh, they have signed a treaty, we watch these anglers, they have no say. Whereas we have the chance in regards to truth and reconciliation that we want to have our input in, mm -hmm. in, into the uh, uh, our impact on the fish, fish and grounds. We have to have an input in it. We have that chance. That, that window is open for us. And, uh, <coughs> so, uh, our mom natives, uh, we're not totally against them, it's just the way they the structure is, 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 is put in place. And uh, some of them, I know they, they, they love to eat their fish too. And, and, uh, but I was getting to the Mexican thing. Uh, they can't control it anymore. They have no say. They sent the treaty. And they watch these anglers come in with the fancy motor homes. And they stay there period of time in summer catching fish and jarring it and the water homes just dry and going home. Do they love to eat that fish? It's their question. They're going home and they, they sell it. It's what they think. Uh, us we love our fish. I love what them. But that's the conclusion that they get from that is He's, he's watching his motorhomes in the Vistance River. Uh, 
Nash Watershed and, and they, uh, they, they have no shade, they have no impact of Chrysler Santa Cruz, whereas us, <coughs> we want to rebuild the stocks uh, and, and, and have our impact. And, uh, I will, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Vernon. Uh, that, uh, this is what I mean by our people uh, do, uh, do know our system and our laws, and um, that, that is an example of it. Thank you, Vernon. Uh, Robin? Yeah, I'd like to just add on what Vernon's saying about uh, the gate. Um, when I was a little kid, uh, I would see all the salmon come up the creek, and they would have their beds all the way up the creek as far as uh, two or three miles up that's as far as i would go anyway i would see the eggs and i would see the the other ones covering the eggs the males and females and that gate there uh a lot of disturbance I, I don't see the two going up and trying to do it again i think that's a big disturbance the gate and um, along the skeena river I used to see all these these beds when I was younger, but now there is way too much disturbance all along the whole Skeena River with um, anglers and uh, oh, you name it. That there's everybody going down the beach there, where they're disturbing the where they're spawning. So I used to see that all the time, but now I don't. I don't see that along. Do you guys see that along the Skinny River where they need their beds? Like I, I rarely, rarely see that now. Why? I, I think it's because too much disturbance. Could be the railway chemicals, I don't know. It could be a lot of things. That's why. Okay, Amy, and then Bobby, and then Art. So thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, touch on uh, your question about how long the program would run. And I think I, I heard a question in there about uh, where the funding comes from and can it be used for other things and, and those sorts of things. So um, the fence is funded uh, in part through the, uh, the Git and Yow's, um Aboriginal Fishery Strategy Agreement. Um, and the, I, I don't know how long the fence has been running, and as I understand it, the fences, their value is, as they continue to run, you get more data, and then you can make better decisions because it refines things down. So, and I think Colin explained uh, last time we were here about kind of the theory behind a fence is to figure out how many fish are going by, and they do modeling to figure out what it looks like at the end and all those sorts of things. Um, the the Gitsan Watershed Authority also runs a few fences. There's the one at Slamgish. Uh, I think there's one other one. I brought a copy of the agreement with me. Um, I, and so, within those agreements, the there it is a negotiation every year to talk about shared priorities and, and what the funding will go toward. There are we do have um, other sources of funding that do come up um, around fisheries habitat restoration, coastal restoration, and things like that to look at habitat and, and other things. Uh, there was a recent announcement uh, about the I forget what the acronym stands for. It's they call it the BC Shrift, and it's looking at salmon habitat and and ways to work together in partnership to to improve these things. And there was a call out for um, like for funding proposals to to contribute to that. So. I think there's lots of opportunity right now to find places to work together and it, it's, it's the dialogue that gets us there so we can figure out what things to focus on. Um, I, I'm wondering a bit as I'm you know, thinking about our conversations last time and this time if there might be opportunities to, to go and see the fence and understand how it works and uh, the, I had the opportunity to go out to the adult fence last year and, uh, and see the, the folks that work there and they, and they, run, a, they run a tight ship out there. Um, very professional and, and they're able to explain exactly what they're doing um, much better than I am. And so I, I might want to propose that working in partnership with, uh, with Mark Cleveland and, and, and Charlie Muldoon. How does the program help rebuild the stock? Sorry? How does the program help rebuild the stock? I think the, the fence itself doesn't physically rebuild the stock. 
but what it does do is it gives a way to determine whether or not the actions that we've taken in the, in the ocean or in the river um, are helping that stock improve. It gives us a measure because as I understand it, um, in some of these places where there are fences, people are not harvesting because the stocks are low. Um, so that wouldn't be our typical way of being able to figure out how many are there. Uh, so it's, it's just one, it's a tool, I guess, to figure out how many fish there are and whether or not the, the actions being taken are working. Um, uh, I'm kind of, <laughs> I feel bad push, pushing, no, it's okay. but we're in the fishing crisis. Yeah. To us, we're, we're in crisis. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'd like to see a push uh, for, to, to help rebuild the stocks, mm -hmm. is what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. and you guys have been funding this uh, gate and the fence for a lot of years. How many years? 50 years, 60 years now, and this is still going down, mm -hmm. and we're in a crisis now. Mm -hmm. And we're interested in how to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. uh, the gate and the fence, I don't think that's helping. Mm -hmm. Besides, uh, an indicator when to open and when to close the, the, uh, the tidal waters. I want to see how, how do we basically, you guys got to come up with, you guys got to brainstorm mm -hmm. with, with, with our input, how do we rebuild the stock? It's got to be funding to, for the guardians to, to, to help rebuild the stock. Like, um, we, we swim right through Skila, mm -hmm. we swim in the water this little minutes and we were told to swallow it while they're still alive. It could be a good swim. And, and, uh, and we do that. Yeah. Some of us almost drowned. You <laughs> 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 uh, don't see those yeah. minnows anymore. Yeah. Because too many anglers. Oh, just oh. loaded in terrors. Mm -hmm. Just how spawning grounds. The, the minutes you don't see them anymore along the skin. Mm -hmm. You see, there's a lot of uh, damage done. And, uh, that's why we're pushing to protect our, and, uh, our, our own jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to see uh, a program to, 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 to help uh, rebuilding stocks. Thank you. Okay, so there's Bobby, Hart, and then Patty. <coughs> Whose jurisdiction is the lake? Yeah, well, Sorry. Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction over? The lakes. The lakes. The freshwater lakes? Yeah, there's only freshwater yeah, lakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Abel? That's our, our complicated. <laughs> relationship between the problems. Well, I'm just going to ask you a question that I heard last week. Lake Babine has got nothing to do with this, but that's going to affect our fisheries that they're planning on the fish farm up there. I'd like to know if there's any truth to that. We tried our best to stop fish farming at the mouth of the Skeena. <coughs> the feds are not listening to anybody. In regards to all the scientific data they got, especially back in Sweden and other countries, Scandinavian, which they say some of their river is dead. Mm -hmm. That's a fish farm. Mm -hmm. And imagine if Lake Babine does that. Mm -hmm. And that's where our fish go to spawn. There'll be no fish. Not all people like fish farm. It's not as good as the wild stuff. Can I say something real quick while you're on the subject? Uh, one of my friends from Prince Rupert had a freezer full of fish fish farm. Uh, he left it in there, and um, the whole thing is spoiled. 
from fish farming. Mm -hmm. And they know they know for a fact that it's fish farming. Mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to add on. See, the reason why we're here in a dire street crisis regarding our fish is why we invited the BC government defense and anybody else who wants to join us. A few more years like this, there'll be nothing left in the Skeena River or any river. And what I learned about the hatchery, Brian was one of them. <coughs> running it years ago, and they set the limit the amount of this little, uh, what do you call it, free village? How much they, uh, they, they covered off. Mm -hmm. And I asked why. And they don't know the mortality of these little things when they let them go. Mm -hmm. So why have a cut off limit? Why don't you just keep going? They don't know how many survivors once they're released from the hatchery. And then all of a sudden they cut off the number, a certain number. And the Tisley Oxide one, and usually the first one will be closed down because it's on the native reserve territory. It smithers, I think, has one somewhere. And I don't know about terrorists. They keep going with that. Why is this case box? So the feds or the VC want to help, they have to have provide more funding. They usually only limit how much funding they give to the natives. And see what they can do with it. And most times they don't succeed because they run out of funding, that's it. Same with the other big companies out there, they're not very good corporate citizen. Same with the logging. Logging, clear cut logging just washes away everything. You go down the Skinner River now, there's nothing but rocks. Every time the water comes up, drives the rocks along. I see the flood cost Nothing to hold back the water in the plastic. And as I kept saying to people, there's a creek across here. Me and a friend went across the one there and it's just red with ink. Red, <coughs> you couldn't even see the bottom. Two weeks later, there's a mini flood. I'm not coming back. That's a clear cut. That's why we're trying to push for this as our fish tenure. Let's get some. The feds, BC on the help us, they're welcome. But they have to recognize us also. We have our yolk, like you heard. I can't go and show them the yolks or not. Not unless I have permission. That's all our ayokis. You cannot go in anybody else in that, not unless you have permission. Yet the BC government issued license that they can go anywhere they want. They cannot do that anymore. Like they said, we're in dire street crisis here. That's why we're here. For a long time, it's been, uh, we let the feds, BC run, walk all over us, entrapment, take us to court, confiscate the net, cut down your pole, that's hard work. Yet it's been in our system for a millennium, since time began the memorial, we see. And another thing I brought up last time, when, uh, I think it was Colin or other, but we used to barter with the coast natives. We get seafood from them when we give them moose meat, whatever, goat, berries. 
and then the government stepped in and stopped that. Yeah, that was one of our way of living. So it's up to you guys. We want to work with you people. What do we all want to have from your recognized partners? Just like children we hope. You need to have the input. Most of these things that you brought up were nobody was consulted. You see, oh, that's how you know, that's how long you'll be. That's going to stop. The government wants to work with us to also have to learn our you know, It's not just one way. And along the way, you could integrate. You should be the European. And in some ways, our yoke is more stronger than the European. If we only put it to use, it has not been about us, it's still there. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that maybe you should build more hatcheries. Try and replenish what we've lost. And I said the other meeting, we don't want to be like Newfoundland where they lost their, mm. all their caught fisheries because of the feds. Nobody listened to the natives to fishermen. Yet they're the ones who have knowledge. Just like in some work areas, the boss said to we have a safety meeting. It's got nothing to do with this, but just as hard the government works. Then they listen to everybody, okay, we heard you, now we're gonna do it our way. I can no longer accept that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby. Art? Thank you everybody for um, being here this morning. I, I almost didn't expect to be here because um, I work for the bus. Um, they were set up um, mostly to fix what's happened to us in, in the past. And, uh, and it's not only that, they just want to teach academics and they, they teach university courses and stuff like that. And I think with, uh, with, with the state of our language, uh, um, one of the last generation of speakers, so um, so my time is in demand in that area. And, um, and it's just like everything else, we're, we're working towards fixing what somebody else has done to us. And um, I think um, <coughs> I was talking to my boss this morning, and um, he said, that <coughs> I remember when um, the Hooray Hooray Chiefs um, run into things like what we're doing today, he said, um, um, you and other people like the people on the table here, where, um, the, the older hereditary Chiefs say you guys have a foot in both worlds, they said, and so, and that's what they send us here all the time. And seems to be in decline, so, um, so the Committee of the Whole of the Herbert uh, Hill Chief, they, 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 um, they ask us to sit on the table, they ask us to sit on the table for, for them, and, uh, and when they do, uh, they give us uh, marching orders, uh, basically what
pushed up that slide, that slide down here, it was, uh, like, uh, when you do the generation of fish, then it affects the next generation. Like, uh, and I think uh, when we look at ourselves, um, especially the non-speakers of our, of our people, uh, it was a deliberate thing to take care of one generation and look after the rest of them. That was the thought that left from there. And, um, <coughs> but as far as the fish goes, um, I think we're something has to happen. Something has to happen. And I think maybe maybe the next steps. Um, that we talk about where we'll hope, hopefully find a path to, to, to turn this thing around. And, um, I, just, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for, for me being here with you and, and maybe, maybe we can do something. And I just know. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, Ari. Ari? Uh, thanks. Oh, you know, I, well, so I think this is our <coughs> our fourth meeting uh, with the crisis management team, and I just like to share an observation. Uh, it, I think it stems from some of the discussions we've had earlier today, and also in previous meetings. There, at times, there can be discussions on hatcheries or catch and release, or um, you know, who manages what species, or the role of counting facilities like adult fences or small fences and I think this table is going to be well informed if it can have the support of technical representatives like the Gitz and Watershed Authority. Having these discussions around here um, you know I, I think it, we're not able to um, move forward towards a common understanding without that that base level of of information that that exists and I would encourage to be part of this process because they can help under you know with the understanding of the role of hatcheries or the role of counting facilities and you know not not in determining whether or not it's right or wrong but in determining you know why they're there or the questions that they're trying to answer and so I, I think that we have a need there um, because I don't see enough information um, coming forward to to ensure that we have have that collective understanding, um, the, the the you know if if I could the um, the Kitwonga uh, situation with the adult <coughs> fence, um, you know I think that it it's uh, it's I just wanted to add that you know I think it, that situation came from a question of trying to answer how many fish are there. And you know, there's probably a general feeling like you can't manage what you can't count. And you know, it, if I think there has been a observed declines on that river, and so you know, how many fish are there? And then there's it's one of two counting facilities on that system. So there's a smolt fence at the outlet of Kitwankula Lake. So if you can count how many fish adults are coming back going into the system, and then counting how many young fish the smolts are coming back out, you can start getting an understanding. Of what's happening and if you for example have um, if you want to rebuild the stock you want to know where is the problem and so if you're counting fish coming back and you then can track how many fish are coming back out you can get an understanding of what's happening in the freshwater environment so is the freshwater environment the limiting factor if you see adults come back and then for those same number of adults you see a large number of, of young fish coming out then maybe you can start saying, well, maybe the problem is not in the lake or the lake's tributaries, maybe the problem is elsewhere. And so I just offer that the, the Watershed Authority would be able to potentially provide some more insights into aspects like this around why these facilities are there, the questions they're trying to answer, because I think, I'm not, a per, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong, but I'm just saying it helps I understand status quo and why status quo is the way it is. Um, and. Uh, and I think there's a lot that we could uh, we could do in building that into answering those questions. So um, I leave it there, but I just wanted to, to raise that. Thank you, Patty. Um, Gordon? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, 
that he says is true. When we argue over hatcheries and fishing, we get into scientific. So we hire scientists. Who's the smartest white guy we can find to make an argument for us? And it boils down to trust. We get a lot of smart people. They're pretty darn good at what they do. It's trust. So when DFO tells Charlie, you go around and tell those Indians that you use seven and a half inch mesh, or tell those Indians there's going to be no fishing, or tell them Indians they can only get 30 Chinook. Just trust. Can we believe Charlie? <clears throat> For the past two years, not including this year, Fisheries has opened enclosures. We don't know what they're going to do from one day to the next. And when they opened inland fishery last summer, it was a scam. Only the friends of the fishery department were, were equipped to make money because they knew when it was going to be open. And, they, they, and then when they did open it, there was not enough uh, ice for everybody. And then so when they knew it was going to be open, their friends ran off and got the ice that was available in the area. So there was a lot of disadvantages <coughs> over, over that, and it looked like a scam. It, it goes to mistrust of the Department of Fisheries. The information we get, can we really trust it? And you could hear the chief share. We're not trusting of defenses because the information we're getting there is not helping with the, there appears to be a lot of decline. Maybe we're wrong. So the idea is, is that gonna help the province have access to the ANAC? That's the question for the government. They're gonna to have to determine. Is the information you get from GWA's research, from the fence at uh, Kittanyao, is that information gonna help you get access to the <coughs> ANAC? And at this point, it's not trustworthy information. And Charlie's not gonna make it trustworthy. Mark Cleveland's not going to make it trustworthy. Mark Cleveland's been living up there for 22 years on this fishing fence there. And we have all this problem. So Patty, you're not going to shove us off the GWA or, or these data collecting people. We want you to figure out how it is you're going to get access to the NAC. That's the question for both BC and Canada. And we're here to figure out how we're gonna do that. We're gonna lose the argument if we talk about numbers of fish all the time, the kick sand. Because you have all the funding, you control Mark Cleveland, you control Charlie, you control GWA. We had a meeting scheduled last October 11th in Kilwanga, DFO basically told them, if you guys attend your funding, you're going to have funding problems. I don't know if it was you. So with Zonan backed out, Lake Babin backed out, Kittenhall backed out, within two days of that meeting happening, because they're all worried about their funding. So it's a trust. That's the third thing that adds to the trust. So we really got to work on our trust here. Patty, we got you now. You're a manager, you're a damn good manager, but you also make decisions, you said. DFO, so we're going to talk about access to the NAC. What's going to give you that access? Is it going to be the data that we don't trust? 
What is it? What's going to give you the access? Is it going to be Terrace and Smithers crying about the $25 million each they don't make when there's closure? Because that's another thing on trust. As soon as Terrace sent a letter to DFO, June 1st, fishery was open. All the sports fishermen started flying up and down the river. They don't care about the Aboriginal people. They yell from their boats, degrading comments. And that's the people you guys give the permit to. You're giving them permission. So we got you now, Patty, Amy. If there's any problem on the, on the river, we're going to tell the public that Patty and Amy were there meeting with us. When we put a proposal on the table to try and solve the matter, Patty and Amy were there meeting with us. The public's going to know this stuff. That's why we got communications. There's no more shoving off the responsibility to anyone else. We have to figure this access out. And we got one year to do it. GWA, they don't report to an overarching government. Skeena Fish Commission. There's nobody making a real government decision. There's all bureaucrats and Democrats and managers that are just keeping the system moving. So there's an opportunity. We have an overarching government here that the, the chiefs have decided that's going to be what it is. It's a simgiget, the will, and they enact. And that's what we're saying. We can't argue with you when you come down to data. When you talk about scientists, we can't argue with that stuff. We got experience, and we're not going to be happy. So it's access. It boils down to access. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Amy. Um, I was just going to say I think I think that's helpful, Gordon, to keep it focused on access because it's, it's true. If we get into all the technical pieces and and whatnot, then that's a whole other conversation. Uh, um, I'll be honest, I'm concerned when I hear that the information is not flowing. Um, we do have regular in-season conversations with all the technical staff from every nation and provide information. And um, I don't think there's any secret on those calls that Charlie and, and the DFO don't always agree at all. So, um, so I, I'm a little bit, that worries me a bit because you know there was a lot of work that went into last season and the season before by that technical committee to come together and they actually made recommendations to DFO to that they were going to manage their own fishery and shut it down. DFO did not shut down the fishery or implement the net restrictions. That was, um, it was, uh, we, we were calling it voluntary and the nations asked us not to say that, but to say that it was a uh, management measures by the nations. Yeah. So, so it, it worries me a bit. I, I don't want to leave that impression that it was DFO that asked them to do that because that was not the case at all. This was a a bunch of technical staff coming together trying to communicate with their leadership and um, I think it demonstrated some pretty good leadership and, and work there so I just I do want to make sure that, it, that we don't leave that impression that that was beautiful. Um, so that piece about conversation or communication does concern me. Um, but getting back to the to the access piece which I think you're right that's where we, we we've talked about focusing and and how we move forward on that piece and the communication and and, and Robert, I heard you you talking about you know how others can can come if, and talk about it too and and how do we get those others here and I think that takes us to that terms of reference discussion and who's involved in that and, and how we get down to like the heart of the matter because there's so much stuff to talk about we could go around in circles all yeah. day and never get to the heart of the issue so right. um, I, I'm just wondering if how we, how we move to that place. Yeah. See, that was. Yeah, the additional problem. Oh, sorry, Chair. Yeah, <laughs> that was the additional problem, what we came up with the past two years with the closures. We weren't sure if we were really, the chiefs were closing it. GWA had community meetings, and then everybody was kai eye and complaining about everything under the sun. And the, Charlie never really got direction. He never spoke with the chiefs like this, like you, you folks are doing. Mm -hmm. You're talking to the chiefs now. And uh, so it was unclear if it was 
just the technical group saying there should be closure or was DFO saying there should be closure? But two years ago resulted in some charges under the Fisheries Act to mm -hmm. some people fishing. So that's a confusion that, yeah. that happened back then. So what we really see here today is a problem of clarity. You folks don't know who the heck manages the lake. There's a lot of clarity that we need for all three parties here, DFO, province, and, and us, because now we're in the mix with the an act. And then we, our laws aren't stringent, but that uh, access will be denied. There's always reasons to give access, and there's always reasons not to give access. The law, the IOC sets it all out, and the chiefs are well aware of that stuff. So we could see here that we really have to work on our communications. What what you want to communicate? And we have the entity now, as you can see this, we have the Navy mm -hmm. So we're ready for, for that. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, before we break for a small break, um, I'd like to just make a few of the comments. Um, uh, Earlier on, when I introduced the group, um, I, I said that um, these people are the ones that know about our laws and about how, what happened to our fish. As you heard uh, Salam Hiro say, there was so much fish before the white man came that you would walk across. Of course, you could, you know, but um, you'll sink in. But that is what uh, what, uh, what our people know. And um, you cannot take this and um, ask for technical support as far as this, this concern, because it is ingrained within all of us it is our spirit, the spirit of the land and the fish. So um, when, you have, when you mention DWA, it means, um, well, DWA takes their direction from us. And um, we, we have had uh, meetings with them and um, a lot of the things uh, that we knew we didn't know anything about it, uh, so they're um, so they're subject to manipulation by people who do know, and that would be the government. Um, so, uh, if there's no more comments, I would like to take a break until about uh, eleven o'clock, if that's okay. Ama. Okay. I just wanted to flag before we break. Um, okay. I shared with Gordon I've got a, uh, a commitment that uh, requires me back in Smithers this afternoon. So I've got it until about 12 o'clock. Okay. okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, okay. so that if we want to have discussions after lunch um, that might pertain the province, I'd, I'd offer that we could discuss them earlier. If that's the case. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, before we go, um, we might as well uh, do number four. Um, review terms of reference, province and federal government added. Access to Kids and Fisheries Tenor and uh, We'll do this right after the break. They can issue permits all they want, but just access. These permits don't give access to the NAC. So that's what we want to talk about. And the, the roles and responsibilities are proposed by the Gixan Group. We, we need input from Canada and BC. We'd like to stay away from uh, data gathering and arguing and opinions. We know Section 35 uh, rights is, is an empty box, so we, we don't want to hire 15 lawyers to argue with each other over what that is. The meetings of the team, like all of the rest of the stuff is pretty straightforward. And I believe we have the team right now with with three, the gigs and, darn, I didn't put my phone on, uh, 
on airplane mode, just bear me for a second now. Put it on airplane mode here. <clears throat> there. So we have the team, the core of the team, and then we could decide how we want to add on later. And we have a commitment by a letter from Doug Donaldson. So we don't only have Patty's name in terms of dealing with this process. We have Doug Donaldson's commitment by letter, which is good because this, this is not a war party. This is a peace party. We're, we're figuring out access. And then you go to the to the fish plan. There's some there's some adjustments to the fish plan on page 16, and th those are underlined. And there may be a couple of other places that I missed that were that were uh, changed, and, uh, and I, I forgot to underline it. So I I'm, I'm not trying to mislead you or anything. It, just the underlining here is uh, I may have missed some other changes that I I, may, I, I made. But all in all. This year is open for Canada and BC to put what they want in it, and, and uh, definitely uh, when we look at our discussions today, there is a lot of clarity needed as to the role of uh, DFO and the role of, of uh, the province. And what we see is is a huge amount of people accessing the river. And it's of huge concern to the Gixan. And that's why the Gixan have, have stepped up regarding this access stuff. So you look at the, the terms of reference, and, and I would suggest that, uh, that Canada and BC look at it and uh, put in their, their additions and uh, keep it positive. Try not to attract too much. Uh, uh, Opinions, people with opinions, with data, an argument about the number of fish and all that sort of stuff. Because the issue is, uh, is our jurisdiction and your access to it. So I would, that would be my suggestion. And then, uh, and then if you have any questions to the, to the terms of reference, then uh, just, just give that to us. Give those questions to us. Send it to us. And then uh, we'll meet as a as a our group here and very quickly. <coughs> Having said that, I, I would like to hear from Canada and BC regarding uh, what they suggest about the uh, the terms of reference of the group on pages 15 and 16. Uh, Amy, um, thank you. Um, so I was mentioning to Gordon uh, during the break, and I'll, I'll tell you guys the same thing, a little bit about just who I am and the types of things that I have focused on during my time with the department. Um, I, I've been with the department since 2007, and I, I used to work up in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, working with the Inuvalit, uh, who have uh, co-management as part of their, their land claim up in the Arctic. Um, and then I came to the coast in, in 2009 uh, with the Oceans Program, where we worked on developing collaborative governance and working with First Nations to set up a governance structure uh, that included, um, you know, stakeholder committees and, and things like that. And I've continued that work in my role as an Aboriginal Affairs Advisor, working with nations to um, come as close as we can within our existing uh, legislation and recognize this Canadian legislation to have collaborative governance where we have clear clear objectives, a clear framework for how we're gonna to work together, and that there's no surprises along the way, that we all know exactly what we're working toward, and it's meeting our shared our shared goals, which ultimately at most of these tables that I talk about, it's a, it's a healthy resource that people have access to and, 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 and what have you. Um, for Canada, it, it always does it contain an element of stakeholder engagement because that is one of our um, responsibilities as well that we do need to engage with Canadians. Um, so figuring out how that fits into the process and in some processes, it, processes it's directly linked, in others it's just an understanding that anything we talk about we're going to come back and use that to help inform our, our discussions at the table. Um, so when I look at the, at the terms of reference here I, I applaud you for putting 
this down. I mean, you've got your issue, your purpose, your team. It's been well thought of, thought out. Um, if they're going to be shared terms of reference, it would be great if we we did work on them together. And so I, I can commit to asking some like looking through them, providing some comments, and asking some questions. But then I'd like to sit down and have that conversation. And rather than it being a back and forth of I make some comments and you comment on my comments and that we kind of have that discussion and come to a good understanding because what's written on paper can always be misinterpreted but if we know what our intent was when we worked on that it helps us move forward so that's just my, my, my bit I thank you for you know sharing these terms of reference and particularly some of the changes um, that were made to these terms of reference. I know there was some uh, feedback during our last meeting and I see some of that reflected in here. It, uh, I think the references to the, the um, federal and provincial government does enable us to um, take a look at this and, and I think having it down um, around this, this uh, the crisis management team and what the crisis management team is trying to achieve will go a long way, as Amy was saying. So, um, you know, I think any sort of clarification that we can provide in that regard um, would be helpful. The, you know, the one thing that I see in there, and I think this is part of the terms of reference, is what we're trying to achieve. And when we're talking about access, um, I just wanted to, I don't know if this is a time where I could talk about this in this piece here, if we wanted to talk about it later. If you want. There's, I think, you know, the terms of reference, you know, there's, a, I think I need to sort out, you know, what what we want to achieve first. And we we kind of, we're talking about restricting fisheries and then we're also talking about access. And I think we want to provide some clarification on that. Um, during our last meeting, I put forward some um, thoughts around the access side. And so I've, I've shared, there's a piece of paper here. It's got um, some reference to Taltan territory at the top. And, and what I wanted to do is, is just uh, talk about that before I go, because um, during our Gitsan training, where we had staff come out and learn about uh, the Ayuk and the Nats and, uh, and, and more, um, it struck me that, you know, the access concerns at the Anats, um, we could uh, do more in communicating um, together, I think, around the importance of these areas and what they are. Right now, um, individuals who are going to these areas that are not from this area don't know about them. And so I raised this, we've been working with the Taltan, Kaska, and Taka River Tolingit on on some hunting concerns, and they have, um, they you know, together we have uh, put together some signs that go up in some of their cultural use sites, their hunting camps, and it I think it goes a long way so that when people come to these areas, they know more about them. And so what I'd offer is that you know potentially some of the work, if it is on access, um, I would put forward that communication um, would go a long way because right now, I I think that. Uh, you know, people need to learn about this, and I don't know how they would learn about it if we're not um, putting some information out there for them to consume. So, this is just merely an example of of something that we've done in the past, and it could I bring it because it's a tangible tangible example of something that could be done um, in Gitsan territory as well. Um, so, if there's any questions on that or you know feedback, I'm happy to to do that now. Um, and uh, yeah. Amy? Thanks, Patty. And, uh, I just wanted to add one more thing. I, I brought some stuff as well today, um, and I, I think there's a copy of it there for you. So it's actually two documents. Uh, one is uh, the Fraser River Salmon Table Society Terms of Reference, and the other is uh, the Fraser River Fisheries Peacemaker Terms of Reference. And just a little bit of background on what this was, and um, I think people probably remember back in the early 2000s that there was some violence on the Fraser River uh, where a chief was, was shot at with, a, with a, a BB gun or a pellet gun. And in that instance, he stepped up and said, you know what, no, we're all going to have space on this river and we're going to figure out how to do it together. And so 
that's very much oversimplifying it. But together, the, the recreational sector with, the, with their leadership and First Nations with their leadership, they came together and they, they talked about um, how, what they wanted that river to look like and what they, how they were going to, to share that resource together. And um, so it, it, it went over a few years. They worked on different things together from safety to cultural uh, awareness of each other's fisheries and, and things like that. They put a little video together, which I can send the link called River Manners, and I apologize in advance, the acting is not stellar. Um, but it was, it was just to give people an idea of why this is so important, that it's not just about, because, um, you know, some, some wreck fishermen will hear, oh, they're just trying to kick us out of there. We're Canadians, we have every right to go there, right? Like that's the, some of the mentality. But I think other people truly, they want, understand and they want a balanced approach and they want to respect uh, harvesting by the nations. And, and, and I saw this really clearly at a meeting I was at a few years ago where, and I think you've you heard from Chief Don Roberts about what they encountered on the river back in 2017. And he explained that to a room full of people and, and, and more than one of the rec sector representatives, and these are the leaders within that community, stood up and said, <coughs> We're, we apologize, like we're appalled that that happened. How can we work together to make sure it doesn't happen again? So I, I really think there are allies within the recreational community, um, and, and that's somewhere that DFO can really, I think we can get those, we know who those people are that would be those allies and could be supporters of what, what, what you need to achieve. So it's, I just, but I wanted to bring this up because I thought a lot of work went into this, and they came from a place of violence, so, I think we're already like much ahead of that and we have an opportunity to not get to this place. Uh, okay, uh, the floor is open, uh, Bobby. And most of the <coughs> people you guys work with there are band office. Control. But we're the hereditary chief. We're the only ones that go to a hereditary chief system. And like I said, that you guys have to recognize us as equals, that we are the its own governments. Like I said before, for too long we've been pushed around, stepped on, and everything. Charged for our fishing, which is our Aboriginal right, entrapment, all of those, confiscate your nets cut down your poles. <clears throat> Those are hard work, which has been with us for thousands of years. And like I said last meeting, that we used to barter with the coast natives. They bring up their coast seafood, and we trade moose meat or berries, whatever, mountain goats. And then the government stepped in and stopped that. They started charging people. And that's one consideration where the feds, I don't know who controls that, have to realize. Like the Tattletown, I keep hearing about them. Most of the people you're dealing with are band office. But we are different. We are going through a hereditary chief way. We had our government before European contact. It has not been taken away, or our laws have not been abolished, it's still there. And I keep saying, if the government wants to work with us, the laws have to learn our laws. It's not just a one-way street, where they kept bullying us like they used to do, they still do. And that's the reason why we welcome any help that the feds can do. BC and our neighbors trying to resolve this issue about this crisis. That's why they call it the crisis management team. A few more years, there'll be no more fish, and what's going to happen? Nobody likes farm fish. <coughs> From what I heard, I wouldn't even want to try it. And I'd like to answer to anybody over there, the BC or Feds, and there's a rumor that the Babine want to put in fish farm in their lake. 
If you have an answer for that, we'd like to hear. I've never heard of it. Well, you could, yeah. you're the government. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Uh, uh, it's it the government who issues the permit. I haven't heard of it either. So it may just be a rumor. Yeah, well, I'm just asking because I heard it. I don't know if it's true, that's why I'm asking around. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, okay, uh, anybody else? Well, we have a shortage of time, so I would suggest that uh, BC and Canada just review the uh, terms of reference and seek clarification and be aware that uh, when you present items to us like was indicated by uh, Bob Campbell under the Indian Act there may or may not be a fisheries tenure mm -hmm. here you have a fisheries tenure and access has been stopped on the Gixan Territory, beginning at Legate Creek, going eastward to uh, about two kilometers from uh, Boulder Creek east, and north northward to the headwaters of the Skeena, right into the Taltan Territory. But the closure ends at the boundary of the Gixan. So that's pretty easy uh, geographic area to, to be aware of. And the, uh, so I would suggest that Canada and BC put it together and we meet again on April 29th or May 7th and we'll get, and if we get off of this topic and we get to orientation, then we'll explain why we're talking about April 29th and May 7th. Thank you. Uh, during that review, while we're kind of looking at it, if we have questions, like they might just be process questions to help us put together all of our questions, if that makes sense, would we get in touch with you and Brian and then you can? Right. Okay. Yeah. And when we have to, we'll, we'll, we'll get our group together and we'll meet. <coughs> okay. 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 Um, I'd also like to ask. Uh, um, staff from the Ministry of Indigenous um, Reconciliation and Relations to review the terms of reference as well. Um, I, I think it'd be important to have uh, their feedback because I do see staff from that provincial ministry having a role in supporting these meetings going forward, um, particularly as we're talking about access and, uh, and things that the province does have jurisdiction over, particularly issues like lands. Um, there are things that can be done in addition to signage, like uh, you know, potentially map notations, um, to uh, make sure that these important areas are known, and um, and there you know we can explore financial support to to also um, to achieve those ends. And I would need their support uh, to have some of those discussions because um, you know in my in my day to day I. I do look after kind of natural resource management and that is getting um, outside of the scope of what I typically do so I need some additional support from those staff. So just wanted to flag that there may be some individuals from the province participating um, to support uh, this going forward that would be in addition to myself uh, or in lieu of myself if depending on the discussion at hand. And similarly, we have, I don't know if you saw the letter that came out last week from uh, the Regional Director General. It went out, I don't know which distribution they list yeah. used to get it out, but um, about uh, the new Reconciliation and Partnership Branch within DFO. Um, and so David Didlock is our head of that. So I've been talking to him about this already. My current position has a functional reporting to him. Um, and then I'll also be just checking in. I have uh, colleagues with CERNA as well, just to see how it all fits together, because we're always looking for ways to support any of these initiatives, because sometimes DFO doesn't have a ton of money, so <laughs> yeah, that's fine. we're always really creative. <laughs> so we'll, we, we leave it at that for the uh, terms of reference. We'll, we'll wait to hear from you. And uh, if the chair agrees, we can get into number uh, number five now.
Okay, uh, number five, uh, set dates for orientation. Um, tentatively, that'll be the 29th of this month or the 7th. Um, select chairperson, each party, nominated person. Uh, and that uh, was, um, by Gordon's, uh, Gordon said it might be um, done at the orientation. Yeah. We'll adjust the term of reference further at the orientation. The, the proposal for the orientation is uh, number 17 on the document. And we, we already have a, a site that's ready to, to have the meeting. And it would be this group, uh, Patty and whoever you want from the province, uh, Amanda and Amy. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. I've been called all kinds of other things. <laughs> Amy and whatever, whoever you want to bring. And then, My plus um, one. <laughs> we'll have our group there. This the Chiefs here will be there, and that's April 29th. Start at 9.30 and, or May 7th, whichever day you guys could pick. That's the day the facilities are, are available. Oh, oh, May 29th. It can't be there if it's on the 7th. Yeah, he's got to go. Okay. So it's up to so 29th is what we're looking at with BC and uh, Canada to make make that date and and the draft orientation program is set out uh, set out on page 17. Right now we have uh, currently there are three jurisdictions. We have uh, the first two are the Division of Governmental Powers in 91 and 92. That's Canada and BC. And then they have the, uh, the Big Sand jurisdiction over the ANAC. And then uh, you see on uh, numbers uh, one, two, and three sets out the provincial jurisdiction. You have a legislative jurisdiction, but it, to make a long story short, the uh, Constitution doesn't set out who owns the land. But it says you have legislative authority and, and administrative authority for the province. And then the number four is we added the provincial angling, angling licenses and the angling guide license. I don't know why it says authorizations. It should say licenses. The uh, federal government sets out uh, number five, the legislature. Legislative jurisdiction on the 91 wild sea coast and fisheries it includes foreshore and offshore. And uh, we're mindful that the ministry has closed the Chinook on the Fraser River. And, uh, and your ideas about the uh, fish fence, we'd, we'd like to uh, spend a day orienting ourselves so that we'll all clarify, for example, who who manages the lakes, who manages uh, the ANAC, and we'll be actually at an ANAC. That's where this, on April 29th, the meeting will take place at an ANAC. So you will actually see one, feel one, live one, and eat food from the ANAC. And then you'll see the Gixan, uh, from seven to 10, sets out the Gixan uh, jurisdiction over the rivers and lakes based on the ANAC and the authority, why it is that the chiefs have authority on the ANAC. And then the law says there's no trespassing on the ANAC without permission. And we'll cover all that. And the, uh, the Oak states that uh, playing in any manner with fish is unacceptable. And the year that uh, the province wastes 10% of the fish, and that's also unacceptable with the IO. So we have to deal and address with all these, these situations. And we're not going to say uh, EFO or the federal government's wrong, and we're not going to say BC's wrong, and we're not going to say that the gigs are wrong. What they're doing is setting out exactly where we're coming from on, on, at that, on that day. 
So in terms of the uh, the draft orientation, please add and delete whatever it is that you think our group met on this yesterday and, and we're ready to, to roll with that, subject to what you have to say because we there's a lot of clar clarifying to do by BC and a lot of clarifying to do by the federal government. And, uh, we want to be very certain that you understand that we're not a band council under the Indian Act, and also that we have uh, this tenure over 33,000 square kilometers. And then uh, we'll set out on those days how and why it is that the chiefs have this, this tenure and uh, jurisdiction over it. So that would be. Uh, what we suggest for that day. Is that open? Is that okay? 29? Uh, I'll have to check with uh, uh, staff for the Ministry of uh, uh, Indigenous uh, Relations and Reconciliation. See what their participation looks like. But I'll do that and then follow up. All right. uh, where's don't, the location? Don't, don't send anybody that's going to negotiate rights and title like uh, Tom McCarthy. He, he does a good job. And uh, rights and title is, is something that you have an opinion about, and we have an opinion about. But the actual fact here is we're talking about access to the enact. Is that what I'm But getting to your question, it's it's about an hour from here. We'll have a sign. It's about an hour from New Hazelton, and we'll have a sign on the side of the road. Turn here, PC. Is it Sky Sky Skyans <laughs> place or? You're gonna bag over your Sky head. <laughs> Were you there, Skyans place? I know where it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Sacramento. Yeah, that's uh, Sacramento. Oh, uh, uh, territory. That's why he uh, he chose twenty nine. So. Okay. Yeah. So. He says he's meeting there. He says stress warm, but he got to bring a lot of mosquito repellent. Yeah. yeah. I do. They don't touch us, but. Thing. They, they know yeah. when the stranger comes in. I'm not sure that I can do it. Try. Give it a try because it's all we got. We, I know. We can't access it's another na I'm meeting with another nation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, they'll concede. Then we'll owe them one. Oh, okay. Right? <laughs> would, would somebody be able to come uh, in here? Um, I'll see what I can figure out. Because I, 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 so as I understand it, this meeting is about sharing each other's mandates and jurisdiction. It's not right. about arguing about them, but right. help further our understanding of right. each other. Clarifying. Yeah. So I think there's a couple things that I would be interested in sharing. And one would be to um, uh, explain how DFO currently manages for food social ceremonial access. And I know there's consultations going on about that right now, but I think I could explain that. I think that might help. And then maybe explain a bit about how, how that fits in with the AFS program. Perfect. We'll have a whole day then. So if, you, if need be, we can trade off if they want to trade off sometime in the future. Yeah, yeah, I was hoping it, it might work because I actually I have to be in Terrace on the 30th, so it kind of could work. I just need to make sure they don't need to in this other meeting. So okay. make sure coffee can go to the other building. Then we can deal with the... Uh, yeah. So that's what we will do. Now we have some other items on the agenda and we have 25 minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, communications get the message out in the, in the jurisdiction of each party, different histories, tenure, access to tenure. Okay, that's uh, numbers, uh, number six. <coughs> yeah. um, eight Ruby. Hey. Ruby. Ruby. Yeah. You're that. Yep. Could you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. So as far as communications and some of the initiatives that the Ginsung Hill government is going to be taking on is obviously the live feeds. So this is live fed onto Facebook. 
Um, the second, and this is just as far as um, building transparency with members and um, keeping them in the, in the loop of what is happening. Um, it's one of our initiatives. The second one is obviously we're going to be updating our newsletter with um, some of the discussions that have happened. Um, in addition, um, there will be uh, community bulletins and website updates as well as part of the uh, transparency and um, uh, building that communications platform. Um, and quite often, uh, we will do interviews after meetings to sort of have summary reports as well. And it's a tool for uh, not only our members, but for our team as well. Um, if you know, they want to know what happened, it's, it's a tool that you guys can use as well. The short term summary. In the coming months, there will be a long communications strategy put in place. Right now, we're focusing on tactics. Um, so, in the next few months, we will be releasing sort of a, a more detailed strategy. So, um, yeah. Uh, is there any concern from the government? I, I, I don't have concerns with this, but I mean, I think sometimes the challenge with, with live feed and stuff is if things are taken out of context, there is, it does run that, day, that risk, so that's just what I think Yeah, and, and just in addition to being proactive on how communications materials are being used, and I support transparency 100%, uh, uh, but this is the first I've, I've known that this would be live feed. Same. So I, yeah, we need to talk about this in advance a little bit. <laughs> Just so we know that it's happening. <laughs> I can check in with our comms people. Uh, okay, uh, any more concerns on uh, communications? Okay, uh, number seven, establish. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, there was an action I had uh, for number six here around the jurisdiction of each party that I thought might be an opportunity to provide information on. There was a question um, with regards to, if, you know, uh, the issuance of licenses and also the management of angling guides, and so it relates to jurisdiction. I could provide some information on that now, if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the um, there's an important distinction in that uh, provincial licenses uh, that we've talked about. Uh, so far, the licenses that individuals get to participate with recreational angling, they are the under the Wildlife Act, they are the um, responsibility of the Director of Fish and Aquatic Habitat. So that's presently Jen Davis and she works in Victoria. So that is not something that we're res that each of the regions is responsible for. Rather, it has a central um, authority uh, in Victoria and also is identified under the Wildlife Act. So that, that was uh, part one. And uh, part two is regarding the management of angling guides. So um, that is uh, a regional function. So each uh, of the regions in the province has a regional manager and a deputy regional manager. And under the Wildlife Act, those individuals are given uh, statutory authority to, um, to review an issue or, or not issue angling guide licenses. And there's a an application process. There's there's fees paid, um, and uh, they have to take a test, and uh, there's a process um, that that is followed there. So um, myself and uh, David Skerrick in the Skeena region have have that authority around um, under the Wildlife Act. I use authority um, in a in that legislated sense because I think that there is authority in in different contexts, and that's where I pay a lot of respect to. Um, uh, the authority of the hereditary chiefs around this table as well. So I'm not wanting to confuse that, but under the Wildlife Act, um, there is a regional authority to to, uh, to adjudicate that process for angling guides. So um, it also includes uh, compliance measures when angling guides um, uh, take actions that are not in keeping with the stewardship principles that the province feels important. So if they're going beyond what they're uh, license conditions allows, then we have a, uh, a compliance role 
uh, in that as well. Happy to answer questions or provide more information on those on those two aspects. So, uh, uh, the floor is open uh, for um, to ask questions on uh, the guiding licenses and all that uh, that you mentioned. Um, if anybody has concerns. Yeah, um, <clears throat> issuing the guide and license and uh, uh, to us it's uh, trespass would they come on to our land and, that, and uh, uh, we stress that we want to be involved at the beginning of the uh, uh, meeting this morning uh, in regards to the fairness uh, between us and the province and the federal government. Uh, we want to be fair uh, to everybody. We're not, we're, we try not to come on too strong. Uh, it'll just create uh, uh, waste time, create uh, bitterness and whatnot. Uh, but uh, the fairness is uh, is, is, is a big issue to us. Uh, we've been uh, here, Bobby and the rest, we've been uh, trampled on far too long and uh, the accessibility to our NAT uh, <laughs> has been, has been, it's damaging to us. And, uh, like that area where we're gonna meet on April 27th, uh, the land across that has been uh, purchased a couple of times because uh, there's an old community across uh, uh, probably a couple hundred years old. Uh, there's a lot of cash pits across there. And the first buyer uh, took me there and all I said to him, if you, if you wanna, I know you bought the land, but if you if you want to develop the land, you're going to develop the land, but leave the the uh, cash pits and all of those stuff, leave it as it is. Uh, so a few months later, he wrote me a letter. He wants to exchange that land to to Leagate Creek, and I said, well, I got nothing to do with Leagate Creek. You have to ask your uh, chief. Uh, Lola about that land uh, that I can't say yes or no to you so he sold that land uh, and now they want the development and we say the same thing so I don't know what's going to happen probably going to sell it again without the knowledge of the next buyer or what we're seeing so uh, we're trying to uh, stop them from from our like a memorial bed, I guess you could call it that. And uh, uh, just uh, part of our history is there. So uh, the access to to our fishing site uh, is is a big issue for us because uh, we've been threatened with rifles and stuff like that if we cross the fee simple land. And uh, so I think the anglers, uh, we need to uh, sit with them and uh, we're open to sitting with them and uh, uh, discuss what we faced in the past and come to an agreement between it, between us. Uh, so yeah, I look at it. I mean, Thank you, Brendan. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, there's been lots of incidents. Uh, my two sons are like fishing. And some of the people, they try to block them from going where they fish. And the government broke their own rules, their laws. And the Dalamo position came along. They weren't supposed to sell any more land. 
that it's still happening. Without acknowledging its own territory or consultant to anybody, it's just sell them. Mm -hmm. So you no, no longer be able to go fish where you used to fish. And that's one of the big problems you now we have. We're just talking about fish now, but later on we'll be going on hunting, and that's the same thing. Like I heard the Teltan only allow a few hunters on their territory. I don't know those So everybody's coming down south. And usually the non natives got the first dips on the moose. Yet we were restricted to go fee simple then. There's a place up nine mile mountain we should go, now there's nothing but fence. So we just turned around. That's the same with that one. And I kept hearing about trespass, what cost? There'll be some people that are going to get against it, I know that. Yeah. And live through it. And just turned 76, that's how long they've been on this earth. One time this young game warden came after me. He can't hunt here, he said, why? You don't belong to this village. He said, my grandmother is born here. And just to make a long story short, I said, I said you know what? I said, you were still passing yellow when I was walking my territory. He walked away. He said, if you keep this up, I can chase you off the territory. There's nothing you can do about it. I know I'm not supposed to really bring this up, but there's one thing about the feds. When there's trouble, the RCMP doesn't come to the aid if they're natives. None of our business. Yet it was the land indigenous for the first time. And if they're deep in trouble, they call the army, which we don't have. So there's one that's going to set respect <coughs> and trust. Got to start somewhere. Think Norman said lunch time. Yeah, uh, we're getting close. Um, uh, okay, there's thank there's you. Art, and then uh, I'd like to thank Patty for uh, bringing that up. Art will uh, talk, and then uh, Gordon will talk about number seven. <coughs> uh, very short, uh, short summary of it, and then after that we will go for lunch. All right. I want to make it very short. Um, See, um, we, we have a bit of a time crunch, and, uh, and, uh, and I think we should all be thinking about that. And, uh, and I think that if the word gets out to our own community, we'll be getting a lot of support from the people on the street. So I think uh, their opinions are you guys are doing something right and they say, well, it's about time, it's about time. And, uh, so, so I think we're looking at those kind of pressures. There's pressures on us, there's pressures on you. And, so, and I think with the information that we, we got today from each other, like um, maybe there's something We've got a little bit of tools to work with. Maybe. Uh, thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Um, we're going to, um, uh, Gordon's going to talk a little bit about um, number seven, and then we'll have lunch. Uh, I don't know if you're going to have time to uh, spend time with us for lunch. There's a little bit of lunch. Uh, if, uh, if I have the opportunity, I'd like to. I, uh, 
Yeah, I've, okay. I've got to read around 12-ish. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. The tribunal is, uh, if you look at the orientation that sort of sets out the jurisdiction, and we could see that uh, probably the feds, I mean the province will be able to consider some legislation or something towards a tribunal, um, and maybe the, the feds as well. And we see the this table contributing to to the rules of the tribunal. And an example where the use of a tribunal would be is two examples. When a person, a recreational fisherman with the permit, is told, "No, you cannot access this and that," and he'll say, "Well, I got this permit." Say, then the chiefs will say to him, okay, you can go to this tribunal, make an application to the tribunal, so we could determine, the tribunal will determine whether it or not it's fair for you to access this, uh, or not access the an act. So the tribunal will look at the fairness of the situation. As well, it will look at the fairness of uh, of uh, the, is the issuing of the uh, trespass by the hereditary chiefs in those in each particular circumstance. So, if a fellow from Norway wants to access an act, he can he can apply to the tribunal, and the tribunal will listen to both sides to determine whether it's fair, and also. The tribunal will look at the fairness of, uh, of the Gixan Fisheries tenure. The non-access by reserves, the non-access by fee simple lands and farms, and by uh, and caused by the railroads and the uh, si the situation that uh, people cannot walk along the railroad to go to their fishing sites or to set up uh, a fishing site along the railroad. So those things would be looked at and uh, we can set some time, an hour or two on, uh, on April 29th, where we look at some, whether or not there would be some value to have a tribunal for people to go to, to settle uh, individual disputes. And uh, from there, we'll see what uh, it will give the public uh, some feeling of fairness. On Friday, they cannot access a, a fishing site. They can apply to a tribunal to determine whether or not that's fair. So that's the proposal of the Gixan, and uh, we could get into it a little deeper on the 29th. Thank you. So, uh, you know, uh, in regards to that uh, 29th, uh, you said it would take about two hours to um, to just go over over the, what you just said. Um, would that mean that we'll be meeting here and having a, sm a small meeting before we go to the, to the, an act? Yeah, we always have prep meetings. Is that what you mean? That day, no, no, the 29th. We will be having a prep, I guess, for this. But are we going to be meeting here on the 29th? No. Before no. we go? No, you've got to drive there. It takes you an hour to get there. Okay. It starts at 9.30. So you've got to leave uh, Fritz Rupert at 3 o'clock in the morning and Smithers <laughs> at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so the time is to start at 9.30, and we got a lot of work to do. So it's going to be divided probably into three areas for the day. We start at 9.30. So we, we will Just be warm. discussing it there. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, is uh, everything um, okay for now to have lunch? Oh, Bobby, uh, and then... Uh, we need a motion to like the session to start the process. Oh. Um, are we going to deal with the motions right now? Or? Maybe we should. 
Well, we we uh, okay. Cable do is uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to make sure. Yeah, because we got two motions. So, um, Patty. Yeah, just uh, um, as I I've taken some notes on uh, the gist of the 29th and, and what we're hoping to achieve, um, and I would just offer that if we're able to put a, an agenda together to um, put some some words to paper, um, that would be helpful as I have. In, in making sure that I communicate with uh, other staff that I work with about what this meeting is, that I make sure that I'm not uh, misrepresenting. Okay. Okay, so you want to? An agenda. Yeah, okay. Um, that would be done. So, uh, is that it? Yeah, there will be two items on the agenda. Jurisdiction and tribunal. And, uh, and uh, motions. Yeah, and those. Those are related. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Jurisdiction, terms of reference of the uh, British three. I couldn't figure out the third one. Thanks. <laughs> so the first one on the agenda is the terms of reference of this committee. The second one is the jurisdiction of all three parties. And then the third one is the tribunal. So we should be finished probably uh, nine o'clock. <laughs> but we'll have have lunch for you. Be there at nine thirty. Dress warm. Don't bring any mosquito dope if you can handle it. Jacket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if that is it, uh, I'd like to ask um, Chris Gunn to open the food. Uh, bless the food.